Informs, the largest association for the decision and data sciences, provides the following audio content to journalists for their use in reporting with proper attribution. What follows are four questions and responses from Kimia Gobadi. She's the John C. Malone Assistant Professor in Civil and Systems Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. She's a member of the Center for Systems Science and Engineering. She's a member of the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare, and she's a member of INFORMS. Question 1. How would you describe pandemic fatigue in the summer of 2022, this far into the pandemic? So we're now more than two years into the pandemic, and during this time, our understanding of the disease, how to mitigate and prevent it, and also our response and guidelines have changed. So with this type of prolonged and evolving pandemic, some fatigue is natural. Although this fatigue has been heightened with a a number of other reasons too, including the impact on the economy uh, that we are also experiencing right now for multiple reasons, high politicization of the response, and that includes vaccine hesitancy. And some of the mixed messaging that are coming from the authorities um, in terms of uh, what the pandemic is and how to respond to it. Combining all of these, uh, we're experiencing some fatigue, uh, a pandemic fatigue. And, and this is both for the COVID-19. For instance, we're going through a phase of increased number of cases, but not a lot of uh, the guidelines have changed. And also for Other outbreaks, for instance, monkeypox, um, so there's a little bit of a saturation in responding and adopting public health measures uh, uh, for all of these. Question two, what are the potential risks when a population experiences pandemic fatigue like this? It can create a even more prolonged pandemic and lead to even more fatigue. So it can create a vicious cycle. And... uh, when the pandemic is prolonged further, it can lead to a number of things. Um, one of them being that uh, we could have new strands that are more resistant that would require us to um, have a different uh, strategy in combating the pandemic and uh, uh, maybe even new vaccines as we have seen also. Another part of it is that it will increase um, some inequality in the society for the more vulnerable Uh, population and also for anybody who has any underlying condition that cannot participate in societal activities the way that they were able to before. And there's another part to this um, that with a fatigue in responding to pandemic, um, that would hinder our response to other pandemic, future pandemics and outbreaks. Uh, And again, we are seeing some of it with uh, As the COVID cases are going up and hospitalization and mortality rate is going up in the U.S. right now, we're not changing our behavior and other outbreaks or future pandemics, including monkeypox, um, the way that we can respond to it can be hindered because of the current pandemic fatigue out of uh, COVID-19. Question three, what strategies should policymakers and public health officials be considering to counter pandemic fatigue? So this needs to be a fine balance between data-driven public health measures and also the amount of disruption to life and the economy. So it's not it's not an easy question to answer, but uh, some of the easier things to do is uh, keeping with clarity and consistency of the messaging um, to the public to avoid confusion and flip-flopping. In terms of the decision makers locally and nationally, uh, providing them access to data-driven recommendations uh, uh, from experts, but ideally simple recommendations and not burdening them with too many ifs and uh, details of the data. And for those experts that will be helping with these um, recommendation, enabling them with uh, good and reliable data, which has not been something that we had access to throughout the pandemic consistently. So all of these combined, it could help uh, uh, devise a good uh, public uh, health measure. The other part of it is just uh, encouraging good basic public health measures that we know that works, um, um, hand washing, uh, masking up uh, when at uh, elevated risk, 
isolating after exposure and uh, providing easy access to testing yeah, for anybody who needs it. Vaccination, both for adults and children, remains one of the main ways that we are combating yeah, the uh, pandemic. Uh, so continued, continued access to it and uh, depoliticizing it as much as possible could really help with the pandemic as well. Question four, how can we tell the society is starting to regroup and get past pandemic fatigue? It would be hard to measure individual responses, for instance, voluntarily, uh, voluntarily masking or if uh, somebody is washing their hands. But there are things that we could measure on the societal level in uh, a more general way. For instance, the rate of vaccination is an easy way to look at it and know what the public's response is. Also, any demand for testing could, uh, could be an indicator of how careful the, uh, the public is being and how they're responding to the pandemic. But we can also look at how the pandemic is progressing in the society. The better response should mean that we are able to curb the pandemic a little bit more. So looking at things like the number of cases that we're having, the hospitalization, number of ICU patients and mortality, right? Those are good ways to know if we are able, if we've been able to combat the pandemic um, and a lot of it would be from the public. Please see the audio content release posted alongside this clip for attributions, sound by length, and transcriptions. Any other questions can be sent to Ashley Smith, Informs Public Affairs Coordinator at asmith at informs.org.